Welcome back to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry. Here's your host, Brother Robert Johnson. This is episode 356. In the news this week, man, some crazy stuff going on in terms of conversation. The United Grand Lodge of England released a new policy about transgender and uh, what's being accepted in the Grand Lodge of England under their grand jurisdiction. And, I mean, personally, I thought that it was a really good move. I think it's moving toward a more equitable stance. But I understand not everybody thinks that way, and, and I'm okay with that. So there were some heated conversations online, but I think for the most part, everybody kept their cool. It was a really good experience uh, chatting with some brothers as we explored things like the history of our obligation and where that verbiage comes from. Specifically, I'm referring to the men-only stance, which is what many people have an issue with with this policy with UGLE, but uh, I'll take up no more of your time uh, regarding that. Uh, If you're interested, you can hop on any number of threads on Reddit, on Facebook, all over the place. They pretty much lit the internet on fire with that one. In other news, I owe you guys an apology. So last week I was headed out on vacation and I recorded an episode and I recorded a paper that I had already read back in the 150s range. So if it sounded familiar, you're not crazy. Uh, I do have to apologize for that. I didn't even uh, realize it until it was too late and I was four hours away from home. So my apologies to everyone. However, this week we've got a really great paper that I know I've not read and uh, we have illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison on the program for a wonderful segment on Ray Denslow in the Masonic Minute. Coincidentally, it's also part of a Midnight Freemasons article that he recently put up, and it concerns a project that he's been working on. I think you all will enjoy that segment. Other news, the all-new Whence Came You lapel pin is in the works. That's right. If you go on over to wcypodcast.com, click on the limited edition shop right at the top, you'll see the new design. It's contemporary, it's a little bit different, and really seamless. That is all thanks to Edgar Alejandro of Masonic Revival. That is MasonicRevival.com. He is ever so gracious in assisting us with the production of these pins so that we can help support this program. And of course, if you are not familiar with MasonicRevival.com, you got to get over there right now. Check out the website. It is absolutely wonderful. Things that you're going to find on his website are things that you're not going to find anywhere else. If you happen to follow me on Instagram, you likely saw a quick little video I put. Brother Edgar did my past district deputy grand master apron, and he also did it in his deluxe apron case. The first thing I have to say is the apron is luxurious in quality. That's the only word I know how to say. It sounds cheesy, but the silk and the padding inside of it are amazing. So consider Masonic Revival for your next apron. You won't be disappointed. And the apron case is probably the best one on the market, I think. It has a double zipper. It's got a cool pocket inside. It holds a couple aprons and it's sturdy. And you can see in the video, the stitching and everything is really amazing. Uh, But he's got everything on the website. He's got watches, bow ties, self-tie clips, pocket squares, decanters, pins that you can't get anywhere else. He even has a Masonic humidor that holds 20 cigars. I mean just fantastic items. One of my favorite things that he's got right now is the ball cap, which is awesome. You know, I'm not a really big fan of the 2B1 Ask one, but on this hat, it just says, just ask on the back of it. And I think that's so cool. But anyway, check out MasonicRevival.com. Show him some love. He's helping us out so that we can produce this program and you won't be sorry. Let's get into our first piece this week. It's actually a really long one, so it's our only piece this week outside of the Masonic Minute, but let's get into it anyway. It's from The Builder, January of 1918, The Grand Orient of France and the Three Great Lights by Brother J.H. Ramsey, Iowa. The grouping of England, America, and France as allies in the present war has furnished civilization with many peculiar situations in which masonry shares. Believing that our members will be deeply interested in knowing the facts surrounding the non-intercourse of English-speaking branches of the fraternity with the French, we announce a series of articles of which this is the first 
dealing with various aspects of the situation. The first, distinctly historical in its scope, is a paper which was prepared by Brother Ramsey in response to a question proposed at a study club meeting of Anamosa Lodge No. 46, in which the sole effort was to present the reasons why the Grand Orient took the position it did regarding the use of the Bible and the subsequent action of American Grand Lodges. At the Lodge discussion, when this paper was read, two ministers of the Gospels were present. One of them had traveled in France and was familiar with the subject which caused him to take a most sympathetic attitude toward the French viewpoint. The second contribution on this subject comes from the pen of Brother R. E. Kellett, Grand Master of Manitoba, and though it bears the title Internationalism and Freemasonry, its dominant theme is the position which the Grand Orient of France occupies in the Masonic category. The essay was written before the entrance of America into the war. It has been read before the Masters and Past Masters Lodge of Christ Church, New Zealand, bringing out a discussion which we hope to be able to digest for our readers in due time. This discussion, occurring in the Lodge most intimately associated with the Mother Grand Lodge, revealed a wide diversity of opinion on the subject, as it will undoubtedly do among our own members. We mention this particularly not only because it reveals the broad-mindedness and temperate spirit of our New Zealand Brethren, but because the very fact that the whole session of the Masters and Past Masters Lodge was devoted to it is in itself significant of the scholarly qualities of the paper. The third essay, Freemasonry in France, has been written at our request by Brother Geo W. Baird, 33rd degree past Grand Master of the District of Columbia, whose name is already a familiar one to our readers, and who was made a Mason in Portugal in a French lodge. Through his position as fraternal correspondent of his Grand Lodge, Brother Baird has had an exceptional opportunity to keep himself in touch with world movements. This article will appear in an early number of The Builder. All of these contributions, evidence, and eagerness on the part of the writers that some way shall be found by which the non-intercourse of nearly forty years shall be eliminated, justification for careful research of the facts, if needed, may be found in the recent action of the Grand Lodges of New York, California, Kentucky, permitting their soldier members to visit lodges in France. The question box and correspondence columns of the Builder are open to you, brethren. We wish to hear both sides, and know that there are many who will not be slow to take up the cudgels in support of this historic position heretofore taken by our Grand Lodges. If this discussion shall be the means of ultimately acquainting our members with the facts, it may also give French members of the society an up-to-date expression of the American position, a result which may perhaps be the influence to both sides in the future from the editor. Just 40 years ago, or to be exact, on September 14, 1877, the Grand Orient of France voted to eliminate from its ancient constitution the following article, quote, Freemasonry has for its principles the existence of God, the immortality of the soul, and the solidarity of mankind, end quote. It adopted it in lieu thereof the following, quote, Whereas Freemasonry is not a religion, and has therefore no doctrine or dogma to affirm in its constitution, this assembly has decided and decreed that the second paragraph of Article 1 of the constitution, above quoted, shall be erased, and that for the words of the said article the following shall be substituted. 1. Being an institution essentially philanthropic, philosophic, and progressive, Freemasonry has for its object search after truth study of universal morality, science, and arts, and the practice of benevolence. It has for its principles absolute liberty of conscience and human solidarity. It excludes no person on account of his belief, and its motto is liberty, equality, fraternity." End quote. At the next annual session of the Grand Body in 1878, a move was made to conform the ritual to the change of the Constitution and a committee directed to make a report and recommendation for consideration at the following session. Accordingly, in September of 1879, upon report of the committee, a new ritual was adopted wherein all references to the name and idea of God were eliminated, but liberty was given to the lodges to adopt the new or old rituals as they should see fit. We are told and can easily believe that this action was taken in the Grand Lodge session amidst great excitement and in spite of a vigorous and determined opposition of the minority. Naturally, and as a matter of course, the change in the Constitution and ritual permitted the removal of the Bible from the altar. It is not too much to say that the Masonic world stood shocked and astounded at this radical departure taken by the French Masons. 
Probably nothing in Masonic Affairs, with the exception of the Morgan episode, ever excited such widespread interest and apprehension. The Masonic press in every country was filled with vigorous discussion, and many felt that it foreshadowed the division of the craft into two great sections, one believers in deity and non-political, and the other atheistic and democratic. Grand Lodges, especially in all English-speaking countries, lost no time in condemning its bitterest terms the action of the Grand Orient and in severing fraternal relations. In our own state, Iowa, in the Grand Lodge session of 1878, the Grand Master said, quote, The Grand Orient of France, having obliterated from its constitution the paragraph which asserted a belief in the existence of deity and by such action placed itself in an antagonism to the traditions, practice, and feelings of all true and genuine Masons in this jurisdiction and the world, deserves no longer a recognition as a Masonic body from this Grand Lodge. Some years ago, that Grand Lodge Orient persisted in an invasion of the American doctrine of Grand Lodge sovereignty to the extent of organizing lodges in the jurisdiction of the Grand Lodge of Louisiana and other states. We then cut loose from a time from all fraternal intercourse with French Masons rendering obedience to that Grand Orient, having not only set at naught the supreme authority of American Grand Lodges over their respective jurisdictions, but that of God over men and Masons. We should wipe our hands of all such bogus Masonry. End quote. The deep concern with which the Grand Lodge of Iowa viewed this matter was but an indication of the sentiment prevailing in Grand Lodges all over English-speaking countries at that time, and in order that we may realize something of this, let us read the resolution of our Grand Lodge in 1878 to the most worshipful Grand Lodge of Iowa. Quote, The special committee to whom the Committee on the Most Worshipful Grand Master's Address referred so much of the same as relates to the Grand Orient of France submit the following report. While we cordially agree with and endorse all of the views of our Most Worshipful Grand Master and the Committee on this subject, yet we consider that its importance requires more than a mere resolution. If the course of the Grand Orient of France is allowed to go unrebuked and become the recognized law, we may well say farewell to Masonry. It is the glory of our institution that we do not interfere with any man's religious or political opinions. At the same time, we discountenance atheism and doubt, disloyalty and rebellion. No atheist can be made a mason, and the first inquiry made of a candidate after entering a lodge is, in whom does he put his trust? These are the essential requisites, and the cornerstones on which our Masonic edifice is erected. Remove them, and the structures fall. What is the course that the Grand Orient of France takes? They have entirely blotted out this necessary qualification and leave it to the quote-unquote ips dixit of each initiate to decide as he prefers, thus entirely ignoring the imperative belief in God as his attributes, as understood in all enlightened countries. American Masons will not submit to such monstrous proposition, and the mere thought of it is well calculated to arouse our indignation and dissent. We protest against such an innovation and quote-unquote wipe our hands of it. Let such sentiments prevail, and our enemies will desire no better argument with which to destroy us. The Grand Lodges of Ireland and England have set noble examples to the Masonic world by remonstrating and breaking off all intercourse with these iconoclasts. Several of our Grand Lodges have followed their example, and others will doubtless soon join their ranks. We feel that we speak the sentiments of the Masons of Iowa when we say that we disapprove and condemn the course of the Grand Orient of France, and we desire to express these opinions still more emphatically emphatically by the resolution hereunto appended. Resolved that the Grand Lodge of Iowa, having learned with surprise and regret that the Grand Orient of France has departed from the ancient landmarks by blotting from the Constitution and ignoring the name of God, and not making a belief in deity a prerequisite for the initiates, does hereby express its indignation and the course she has taken, and herewith severs all relations heretofore existing between us. Resolved that a copy of this resolution be sent to the Grand Orient of France, and to each of the Masonic jurisdictions with which we are in amicable relation. End quote. With both friends and enemies of Masonry unreservedly condemning the action of the French brethren, it would seem that there must be little justification or defense. But, as is usually the case, there were two sides to the issue. There were some peculiar circumstances, including such a radical departure, and the most interesting part of this discussion will be to learn that the motives and objections which actuated those responsible for it. Do not forget that if allowed to exist at all in a Catholic country, as frequently they could not, Masonic lodges necessarily be much different in character than ours in this, quote, land of the free and home of the brave, 
France and the French people had been under the dominion of the Catholic Church from time immemorial, and at that period a large majority of the population were its members. The church controlled all affairs of the state. Of course, Masons were struggling for liberty, justice, and equality in order to accomplish the separation of the church and state and to loosen the hold of the church on the school system and public affairs. It was essential that the reformer should be united and that none should be excluded by reason of his belief. Thus, the Grand Orient stood as the logical nucleus around which an organization might be effected. They needed the support of all men of every shade of religious belief. Hence the declaration of absolute freedom of thought and the elimination of all dogma, quote, unquote, the starting point of narrowness and persecution. This was in 1877. In 1907, 30 years later, France accomplished the division of the church and state and Catholicism no longer remained the, quote, unquote, religion of France. There was another factor in the controversy, the Scottish Rite body of masonry, with which the Grand Orient had been in continual controversy for many years over matters of jurisdiction and the right to confer certain degrees. The Grand Orient Masons have always resented the accusation that they promulgated unbelief and atheism. In fact, and in support of an opposite contention, they cite the circumstance that when the amendment to change the Constitution was proposed, at a meeting of the council, preliminary to the grand session, a Protestant minister, M. Desmonds, drew the report in support of the resolution in which he argued that the disappearance of the original article of belief would not imply a profession of atheism, but merely an admission into the craft of all men of all opinions, and that masonry should welcome men of all doctrines and every shade of thought. Here is the idea of a member of the Grand Orient expressed only a few weeks since. Quote, the Grand Orient of France, while it respects all philosophical beliefs, insists upon absolute liberty of belief. This does not mean that we banish from our lodges the belief in God. The United Grand Lodge of England, on the contrary, desires to make a belief in God in some manner compulsory. The Grand Orient of France is much more liberal, since in proclaiming the absolute liberty of belief, it permits to each one of its members the liberty to believe or not to believe in God, and by so doing, desires to respect its members in their convictions, their doctrines, and their beliefs. This is the reason why fraternal relations do not exist between the United Grand Lodge of England and the Grand Orient of France. We regret this exceedingly. England has always been considered, rightly in other respects, a country of liberty. It is difficult to understand, under the circumstances, why the Freemasons of this great and noble nation should want to deprive their brothers of France of this same liberty. End quote. Brother J. G. Findell, the well-known scholar, historian, and journalist, in writing to the London Freemason in 1878, aptly stated the contentions of the French body in these words, quote, But it is not my intention to give such general declarations onto the true meaning of the royal art, as it seems more necessary to help to a right understanding of the resolution of the Grand Orient of France. Our French brethren have not deserted the belief in the existence of God and immortality of the human soul in striking out the discussed words of the first article of the Constitution, but they have only declared that such a profession of faith does not belong to Masonic law. The Grand Orient has only voted for liberty of conscience, not against any religious faith. Therefore, the true meaning of the French Constitution is now only that each brother Mason may believe in God or not, and that each French lodge may judge for itself which candidates shall be initiated or not. The French vote is only an affirmative of liberty of conscience, and not a negation of faith. The excommunication of the Grand Orient of France by Masonic Grand Lodges is therefore an intolerant act of popery, the negation of the true principles of the craft, the beginning of the end of the cosmopolitan Freemasonry. The excommunication of the Grand Orient of France only proves the sectarian mind of the excommunicating Grand Lodge, which have forgotten that Masonry has for its purpose to unite all good men of all denominations and professions. They profess the separating element and destroy the craft, and waste the heritage of our more liberal and more tolerant forefathers. The Masonic Union will, in future, be a mere illusion if the Anglo-Saxon Masons condemn the French, German, Italian Masons, etc., and vice versa. End quote. The great questions of recognition, invasion of jurisdiction, establishment of irregular lodges, and many other matters which grew out of this movement can hardly be followed here. They are worthy of further discussion. What we started to tell was, quote, why the French Grand Orient removed the Bible from its altar, end quote. It has been noted in a very brief way how they did it, and under the exigency of the situation, got by with it, with a good conscience, that they were 
actuated by high purposes few will deny, but most Grand Lodges then held, and still, that Masonry cannot be Masonry without a strict adherence to the requirement of a belief in God. Few of the Grand Lodges, severing relations, have ever resumed them. Such action is still within the range of future possibilities. Who can tell? So that, everybody, is the first part of the article. That is almost like the introduction to the rest. Let's carry on. The Builder, February 1915. Internationalism and Freemasonry by Brother P. E. Kellett, Grand Master of Manitoba. Part 1. Owing to a lack of space, we have, with Brother Kellett's permission, divided his article into two parts. In the present issue, he summarizes for us the attitude and activities of the Grand Orient of France. He uses official sources, and while at first pass it may appear that the Grand Orient has encroached upon political preserves, it will be well for us to hear Brother Kellett through before rendering ourselves a decision. In the second installment will be presented a point of cleavage between Anglo-Saxon masonry and the masonry of France. With meteoric suddenness, the present war has ruthlessly cut off many lines of communication and channels of intercourse between nations and peoples. Freemasonry has suffered with the rest. This catastrophe has so jarred the mechanism of our daily lives and impaired the development of the human race as to make us realize more than ever before the distinct advantage to being obtained from international cooperation. To attain the highest efficiency socially, morally, commercially, and otherwise, the cooperation of one people with another is necessary. We are interdependent upon one another. The organization of the relations among men on a universal basis embracing the whole of the uninhabited world has been demonstrated to tend to the greatest good. When each of the peoples of the earth lived unto themselves alone, little progress was made, especially along the higher ethical lines that tend to be the broadest development of a nation. Love of self reigned supreme, the law of the jungle prevailed and might prove right. The evolution of the years modified these ideas as people came to know one another better through the intercourse of trade. Old prejudices gradually broke down and civilization took a wider meaning. International conventions were called to consider the betterment of relations between people and people. These gave birth to international services, all tending to unite the civilized world in a common action for general progress and to assure to human activity the fullness of its powers. We had reached the point where we were dreaming of a better life, universal peace, harmony, and progress. The masses today are uttering a cry of hope that the present barbaric struggle may not be in vain, but may prove to be but a stepping stone to even better things. May their hopes come to fruition. No association exists which more naturally tends toward the internationalism than Freemasonry. Anderson's Masonic Constitution, promulgated in 1723, said the following, quote, Ye shall cultivate brotherly love, which is the foundation and the master stone, the cement and the glory of this ancient confraternity, for we as Masons are of all races, nations, and languages, end quote. An eminent present-day writer on Freemasonry has said of it, quote, high above all dogmas that bind all bigotries that blind, all bitterness that divides, it will write the eternal verities of the fatherhood of God and the brotherhood of man, end quote. Its origin, past history, organization, and philosophy all lead in the direction and have no other goal than universal brotherhood. A great deal of good can be accomplished by a worldwide fraternal connection between Freemasons of all countries. Masonry's aim is the fraternity of men and the spread of the principles of tolerance, justice, and peace. How better can this be accomplished than by mutual understanding? If we continue to hold ourselves aloof, will we ever attain the object we seek? Is it not astounding that Freemasonry should still be divided and so far from being united? Would it not seem that every Mason should use his influence to help weld the chain of the international fraternity for the accomplishment of universal unity, peace, tolerance, and mutual goodwill. It is my purpose to point out to what extent the Freemasons of the world are disunited and what the main lines of cleavage are. In particular, I desire to give some information about the Grand Orient of France, which is a representative institution of that class of Freemasonry toward which Anglo-Saxon Freemasonry has had particular antipathy. According to the latest available statistics, there are approximately 2,100,000 adherents to Freemasonry scattered through all countries in the world. These have been divided into three distinct groups. Authorities say they do not differ materially in customs, principles, or traditions. In what they can then, how can they rightly differ? The divisions are made because of the greater or less importance given to religious ideas. 
To quote the International Bureau of Masonic Affairs established in Switzerland with the aim of completing an arrangement whereby Freemasons of all countries may mingle with one another in the lodges, visit one another, and learn to know one another, these divisions may be given as follows. Quote, 1. The first group regards as being of absolute necessity the adoption of what are called the landmarks, and in particular these two, a belief in the grand architect of the universe and the presence of the Bible on the altar. Some of this group decline to receive into its lodges masons who belong to groups which do not admit these two landmarks. Others of this group also revere the grand architect of the universe and possess the symbol of the Bible, but they do not close their doors to any visitor who proves himself to be a mason even when his obedience admits neither the formula of the Grand Architect of the Universe nor the Bible. Our brethren of the Grand Orient of France are welcomed with pleasure by them. 2. The second group, which comprises part of Latin masonry, leaves to its adepts the right to believe in God, even in the esoteric God of the religions, and imposes on them no act of faith which does not hinder it from admitting to its lodges all visiting brethren to whatever obedience they may belong, and without any other proof than their title as regular masons. This group holds the principles of mutual tolerance, the respect of others, and oneself, and the absolute liberty of conscience. It does not allow of any dogmatic affirmation. The third group comprises purely Christian masonry. Very much of interest could be said in giving an account of the effort made by the International Bureau of Masonic Affairs to the furtherance of mutual friendship and brotherhood among the Freemasons of all lands. Considerable progress was made, and particularly on the continent of Europe. It developed considerable enthusiasm for the fraternal object aimed at. The war for the present has brought their peace activities to a close. In one of their latter official bulletins, they say regarding it, quote, If we were pessimists, we should once for all give up our plans, our endeavors, and our work in behalf of an improvement in the relations among men. But we know that in spite of everything, our cause is the best, and that nothing, not even the most overwhelming upheavals, must discourage us. It will behoove the friends of peace and of fraternity to proclaim to the world that the ideas of which they are the guardians may be defeated, but that they never die and never surrender. End quote. Many times in commenting on the progress of their work in their official bulletin, this bureau has deplored the fact that antagonism still exists between certain Masonic bodies because brethren too readily believe all the evil that is propagated about the masonry of another country without taking the trouble to ascertain facts by making inquiries at a reliable source. They say credence is too readily given to hateful affirmations which are adopted without examination, and they make the plea that brethren make the necessary inquiries from the proper source. They add further, quote, it would suffice to see one another in order to know, to love, and to appreciate one another, end quote. Not wishing to lay myself open to any charge of unfairness acting upon this suggestion, I wrote the following letter. Winnipeg, July 24, 1916. Grand Secretary, Grand Orient of France, Rue Cadet 9, Paris. Dear Sir and Brothers, Freemasonry, being a so-called universal institution, one of whose main tenets is the universal brotherhood of man, occupies somewhat of an anomalous position today, at least insofar as France and English-speaking countries are concerned. Masonically, we do not recognize one another. United as we are in the great titanic struggle now going on in Europe, it would seem that we should also be fraternally united. At any rate, the present would be a most opportune time for considering the matter, as it would surely get sympathetic consideration. The organization which I represent is a Masonic organization in that its members are past masters of regular lodges in this jurisdiction, but it is not affiliated as an organization with the Grand Lodge of Manitoba AF and AM. We purposefully have not sought such affiliation because we want more freedom of subjects for discussion than organized masonry here would allow. All of our members are members of the Grand Lodge, so that the thought and decisions of our association have a certain indirect effect on the actions of the Grand Lodge. I make this explanation to make it clear to you that I am at present making no overtures from the Grand Lodge and have no authority to do so. I simply want to find out from you information with regard to the Grand Orient of France with the view, if possible, through our association of breaking down the barriers between masonry here and masonry in France. I am therefore going to be perfectly frank in my questions, and trust that you will think them more pertinent than impertinent, for impertinence is not intended. I am actuated by a sincere desire to secure mutual recognition, if possible. 
It may be said frankly at the outset that the Grand Orient of France is generally looked upon by the rank and file here as an absolutely impossible organization for us to recognize in any way. You are generally considered to have departed from the ancient traditions of the order to be frankly atheistic and to be in all great measure a political organization. I have heard it said by some here that you have mixed lodges of men and women and that you have made numerous innovations in masonry that are not in accord with the ancient tenets of the order. These are charges which I can neither endorse nor deny, not having the necessary knowledge. As your organization is the largest Masonic organization in France, I can hardly imagine, though, that it can be so terrible as some would have us believe. Will you enlighten me? I believe you were at one time in friendly intercourse with the Grand Lodge of England. Why was that cut off? I presume there was some argument in connection with it. If so, what was your side of the contention? Does the Grand Orient of France control only the first three degrees, or these and the higher degrees as well? There are other questions I might ask, but I have probably asked enough to lead you to give me complete information as to your claim for recognition. I hope you can find the time to answer this by letter. And if you have any printed matter that would give fuller information, I would be pleased to receive it. It would be a great pleasure to me if this would result in the barriers between us being pulled down so that we can grasp one another with fraternal grip and work together for the general good. Yours sincerely, P.E. Kellett, President, Past Masters Association, Ancient, Free, and Accepted Masons, Winnipeg. All right, that's where we're going to leave it this week. So you're probably thinking, come on, I got to know what happens with this letter. And uh, next week, I will read you the correspondence that was received back to Brother Kellett in Winnipeg. But for now, let's go into this week's Masonic Minute with illustrious brother Stephen L. Harrison. Illustrious brother James Williams was a Masonic scholar. Missouri's representative to the renowned Quator Coronati Research Lodge, he maintained one of the finest private Masonic literary collections anywhere. Upon his passing in 2011, he left that collection to his brothers in Missouri. Sorting through the volumes, brothers found four large brown dusty binders bulging with typewritten pages. Upon inspecting the material in them, the brothers realized they had discovered a Masonic treasure. Ray V. Denslow was arguably the most prolific Masonic author of the 20th century. Among his books were Territorial Masonry, The Story of Freemasonry and the Louisiana Purchase, Civil War and Masonry, History of Cryptic Masonry, and on and on. Not only does that list not scratch the surface, but it also does not include the dozens of pamphlets he authored. Most worshipful Brother Denslow served as Missouri's Grand Master in 1931 and 32. He was a founding member and master of the Missouri Lodge of Research, had a close friendship with President Harry Truman, and served as Truman's emissary on Masonic missions around the world. From 1942 to 1945, he served as General Grand High Priest of the General Grand Chapter of Royal Arch Masons International. To that impressive Masonic resume, we can add what he considered his crowning achievement, the founding of the Royal Arch Mason Magazine in 1943. You may have heard of it, you might, in fact, have a copy of it sitting in your living room. He passed his passion for writing on to his son, William R. Denslow, best known for his iconic work, 10,000 Famous Freemasons. He also passed something else along to his son, those four large brown binders bulging with typewritten pages. Brother Denslow, it seems, was a compulsive man. At home, he lived at his typewriter and pounded out every minute of his Masonic journey. The good, the bad, and yes, the ugly. He left those binders with his son, and his son, in turn, handed them to Jim Williams with the strict caveat 
that they were not to be published until everyone mentioned in them had passed away, and for good reason. Ray Denslow pulled no punches. The pages in his memoir record in detail his experiences as an author, a leader, and Truman's personal representative as he operated at the zenith of the craft. It is a study in Masonic politics at the highest level. It is a rewarding story of how Denslow made friends across the globe and worked to unify masonry at the close of World War II. It is also a record of how he crossed swords with a few of the most powerful and influential Masons of his time. Work on compiling and editing this material has been in process for over a year. Now, over a half century after his death, the fraternity is about to see a new book, not about, but by this great Masonic author. The Missouri Lodge of Research did not strictly adhere to the stipulation that everyone mentioned in the book must have passed away prior to its publication. His granddaughter, Judith Denslow Erickson, and his grandson, William R. Denslow, Jr., are not only still around, but each contributed to the book. His grandson, Bill, in fact, helped with the editing process and is the executive editor of the manuscript, bringing the Denslow name to a third generation of significant Masonic works. The first volume of this two-volume set, Ray V. Denslow's Masonic Journey, is now hot off the presses. The Missouri Lodge of Research will distribute a hardbound copy, free of charge, to each of its members, beginning at the Grand Lodge of Missouri's annual communication in September. Frankly, the best way to ensure getting a copy will be to join the Missouri Lodge of Research. Volume 2, as well as soft cover and Kindle editions, will follow in 2019. It's a must read for serious students of Masonic history. For the Whence Came You podcast, this is Steve Harrison with the Masonic Minute. All right, I hope you enjoyed that piece. Again, many thanks goes out to illustrious Brother Harrison for his work. If you are looking to join the Missouri Lodge of Research, I'll have a link to the application right in the show notes. Just click on the link, fill it out, send it in, print it out, whatever you got to do. Fantastic organization, and I can't say enough about it. I mentioned the Midnight Freemasons at the beginning of this episode. Some news there as well. We have a new contributor, Brother Michael Arce, is coming on board, and uh, he'll have his first contribution as a regular contributor coming up this upcoming week. I think probably Wednesday or Friday. We'll see which works out better. Now comes the point in the show. We're toward the end of the show, and I just want to say thank you to everybody out there. We're going to go through some business real quick. Please consider supporting this show. Direct donations through PayPal. You can do that if you just click on that right at the top of our website, wcypodcast.com. You can make a one-time donation, or you can contribute monthly. Uh, You can be a contributor, a fellow, or a producer. We've got three different levels that you can assist us with. All of that money goes right into this program and helps us bring you additional content. I'm working on something really cool cool, really exciting that's going to go through WCY Media, and I think you guys will all really enjoy that. More news to come on that as soon as possible. Another venture that we've got going on is It's Business Time, Adapting a Corporate Path for Masonry. This is a concise book that Brother John T. Ruark and myself wrote together. It's received great reviews. We've got four and a half stars on Amazon. It was the top book in its category and several different categories actually and I hope you guys check it out it's available in print or you can get it through the Kindle if you'd like it autographed then do something different instead of going to wcypodcast.com and clicking on the book there on the sidebar click on limited edition shop and scroll all the way to the bottom and you will see it's business time and I'll autograph it and send it out now it's a little bit more expensive that's because I don't get to redeem Amazon Prime for you guys so uh, it is on Amazon Prime you get it and just uh, two days free shipping if you go through Amazon. But again, not autographed. Other things on the limited edition shop. I've got a couple money clips left with our original Whence Came You lapel pin design. We've got the Mason's Lady stickers. And of course, 
soon you'll be able to pre-order the all-new pin. I'm really excited about it. We had Brother Jason Richards design it. It's a continuing on the tradition and quality. You know, we really moved to this new contemporary and simplified model. I think you guys will really like it. Let me know what you think about the pin design. Hit me up on Facebook. I can't change anything now. It's un it's underway. So uh, hopefully you all like it. Uh, I did run it past quite a number of folks who all seem to really enjoy it. Coming up real soon. We've got Toledo, Ohio, Camp Masonry. I'll be doing the Quantum Series Part 1. That's Esoterics 101, and that's on the first day. On the second day, toward the evening, also I'll be doing The Word, which is the Quantum Series Part 2. Part 3, I'm not giving here, but uh, if you are ever interested in hearing Part 3, it's pretty deep stuff. It deals with mathematics, physics, theology, appropriately, it actually is called Quantum Entanglement and Apotheosis and is the culmination of those two other lectures. But that will be at Camp Masonry. I'll be doing Esoterics 101 and The Word the following day. That's August 10th and 11th. Go to CampMasonry.com to get your tickets to go. It's going to be amazing. I'm really excited about going. And I hope to see everybody there. You know, I was, uh, I've been talking about having... Uh, brother Mike Hambrick there. Turns out he got a brand new job and he's not going to be able to make it. So I'm a little bit bummed out uh, that I won't be able to see Brother Mike there. But there are tons of amazing brothers that are going to be there. Many names that you'll recognize. Guys like Dave Bacon and many others. So check out the website campmasonry.com. It's going to be fantastic. Shortly after that, August 25th, 2018. How about barbecue lunch and a lecture? That's right. The Kansas Lodge of Research is kicking off a new season with barbecue and a special guest. That's me. I'll be presenting on Colonial Freemasonry. They've got a great website set up here. If you go to kslor.org, you'll see the announcement. It just says, for every 1776 history tale, there is a Masonic backstory. Come hear about several of the backstories that will make you a proud Masonic descendant of those characters who risked their lives, their fortunes, and their sacred honors. So Saturday, August 25th, 2018, if you want to eat, be there at noon. Lecture is going to start at 1. It'll be at the Grand Lodge Library and Museum located at 320 Southwest 8th Street, Topeka. The cost is $12.70 paid in advance to reserve your spot. You can register below at their website. I'm really excited about it. Uh, Brother Alex Powers is the director of the Kansas Lodge of Research. Does that name sound familiar? I hope it does. Brother Alex runs one of the best podcasts out there. And I don't just mean Masonic podcasts. He runs a great podcast, Historical Light. You guys got to definitely check that out. Wonderful show. He says that he feels the library and museum is a very fitting venue as we set in on this new path together. He's had a chance to see uh, the presentation that I've done before, and he really enjoyed it. So I hope you guys all come out to that. I know some people were talking about uh, road tripping out. And I hope you do. I hope I can share some fellowship with you as we talk about masonry and colonialism in the late 1700s. After that, what am I doing? Where am I going? Well, after that, I think it's Grand Lodge Sessions, so I'll be taking the train down to Springfield. So if you're in Illinois Mason or you're in the surrounding states, come on down. I'm not presenting or anything. I'm just going to have fun and, and hang out and do some really cool masonry, probably do some shopping and, and all that good stuff. So hopefully we'll be able to see you all there. And then I think... Lafayette Lodge in Indiana. I'll be doing Esoterics 101 in early December. I also want to mention that in a few weeks, maybe next month, I'm not really sure when we're going to get a chance to do it, but I'm lining up an interview with Brother Jamie Lamb, who is the author of Myth, Magic, and Masonry, Occult Perspectives in Freemasonry. So looking forward to that interview coming up in the next couple weeks. Be on the lookout and Lastly, before I get off the soapbox, Fort Worth Lodge number 148 is hosting an all-day Masonic Education Symposium on September 15th. They've got lectures by Brad Billings, Pete Norman, Robert Sanchez, John Tolbert, David Bindel, and Larry Fitzpatrick. Uh, their keynote speakers are Mike Pohl, Pierce Vaughn, and Chuck Dunning. So three dudes who are exceptional speakers and exceptional scholars. Again, Saturday, September 15th, 8 a.m. to 6 p.m. Long day. They are charging. You can pre-order your ticket for 45 bucks. If you buy a ticket at the door, you're going to pay 10 bucks more, 55. So if I were you, I would get on that pre-sale if you're going. And the pre-orders close on August 15th. So that means like real soon, like a week and a half if you're listening to this on time. So if you are interested in that, please go to www 
www.texasmasoniccon.com. And they're on Facebook also. They have a Facebook page. It's at Texas Masonicon. And they have a podcast, fortworth148.libsyn.com too. So check all those out. I think you guys will enjoy if you're in the mood for some quality education. And that's it for this week, guys. I really appreciate it. Please tune in next week when we finish up that Masonic correspondence over the Grand Orient of France. Now, I know some people were probably listening. I should have addressed this earlier. Grand Orient of France is not the Grand Lodge of France. We have two separate organizations in France. One is recognized, one is not. One is more libertine, one is not. So don't be scared (laughs) if you go to France and you think you just can't visit any Masonic lodges. You definitely can. Just check them out. Use that Amity app or maybe grab a Pentagraph publishing book if you can find one. Uh, But check it out. Make sure you get your Grand Secretary seal of approval as well, which will help you. So if you like Masonic podcasts, I know you do. You're listening to this one. Check out the Masonic Roundtable next week. Well, in just a few days, if you're listening to this on Monday, tomorrow to be exact, we'll have Mike Hambrick on talking about the Grand Lodge of Ohio. And the week after that, I'll be doing the history of the Grand Lodge of Illinois. You're not going to want to miss it. I've got some juicy tidbits for you I think you'll really enjoy. And last but not least, the Midnight Freemasons. Mondays, Wednesdays, and Fridays, new posts. Check it out. Don't miss it. We'll talk to you all next week. Until then, stay on the level. For Whence Came You, I'm Robert Johnson. You've been listening to Whence Came You, a Masonic podcast featuring research papers and discussions related to Freemasonry with your host, Brother Robert Johnson. Be sure to join us for our next edition. 